This week on Wookie Drives, we dive back to the forlorn time of the Malaise era with this 1979 Dodge Magnum XE. This car represents the end of many things, from big-bodied Chrysler cars to Dodge's involvement in NASCAR. This is the Magnum I'm sure you forgot. When people hear the name Dodge Magnum, most people think of the sporty wagon that supplemented the return of, of the Charger name in the mid-aughts. But what most people don't realize is that the Magnum name had existed in Dodge's portfolio since the late 1970s, beginning with what you see here. The original Magnum was sort of a last gasp for big, sporty-ish Dodge Coupes. It was a model that took the long, since malazified Charger and tried to make it more aerodynamic to beat on NASCAR's high banks. Well, it struggled on the high banks and it struggled in the showrooms as buyers were shying away from these large B-body boats on the eve of the second oil crisis. All of this was leading to Dodge and its Chrysler parent company towards a bankruptcy that would luckily be avoided thanks to Lee Iacocca convincing the American government to give the struggling automaker a second lease at life thanks to a now largely forgotten government bailout. I had briefly touched upon it, but what exactly is a first generation Dodge Magnum? Well, it was supposed to supplement Dodge's existing but considered largely watered-down B-body coupe, the Charger, as that model had gone from the swooping beacon of the early 70s performance to, well, a squared-off personal luxury coupe. This wasn't really Dodge's fault, as their hand was forced by the cold steel hand of Uncle Sam, as oppressive new smog regulations of 1975 meant that performance from big thirsty V8s was no longer allowed to breathe with the fury, and... The oil crisis of 1973 meant that buyers were fleeing towards smaller and more efficient cars that weren't large boats. So even with the last year of the third gen Charger of 1974, buyers were looking towards lower performance models and seeing the large coupe as a personal luxury coupe, which would become a staple of the Malaysia era. The fourth generation Charger was a huge visual departure from the swoopy models of before with its now squared off style and coke bottle headlights and Lando tops driving a stake through the heart of the muscle car. As a result, NASCAR teams didn't run the 1975 Charger due to it being at a severe air disadvantage over the 1974. Up until the Gen 6 began in 2013, NASCAR teams allowed to run older body styles for a total of three years before their discontinuation, in an effort to help boost car counts. This meant that you could see cars like the Thunderbird continue to appear as late as 2000, thanks to back markers often not being able to afford the newest and latest sheet metal. The 74 Charger continuing to race in NASCAR, however, was purely a performance choice. This also gave Dodge, despite their spending becoming less and less throughout the 70s due to a decline in sales, time to develop a whole new model for 1978. Notably made famous by Richard Petty, the 1974 Charger would continue to win races from 1975 to 1977. Neil Bonnet, driving for coal magnet J.D. Stacy, would win what would become Dodge's last win for 24 years in the final race of 1977 in that year's Los Angeles Times 500 at the now-defunct Ontario Motor Speedway. For the 1978 season, Dodge's factory teams of Bonnet and Petty would debut the new Magnum at Daytona. Initially, things looked good as Petty would start 6th and dominate early. However, after leading 39 laps, Petty would cut a tire while leading and crash heavily on lap 60. Richard and Bonnet would struggle on larger tracks from that point forward. Despite 11 top 10s and 7 top 5s in the first 19 races, Petty would grow dissatisfied with the ungainly car. Bonnet would even score 3 poles, but those were at smaller tracks such as Richmond, Rockingham, and Bristol. They never quite got the handle, and with Dodge increasingly cut and funded, Petty and Bonnet would both switch to GM models to finish the year, and Petty would fail to score a win for the first time in his career since he ran part-time in 1959. Richard would go on to call the car undrivable at 190 miles per hour. In hindsight, it is believed that the lower deck lid compared to the other cars of the time led to this. The Magnum, however, would continue to appear in NASCAR until the smaller 110-inch wheelbase cars would be run in 1981 at the hands of independents such as Buddy Arrington, Marty Robbins, and Frank Warren. In 1979, Richard's son Kyle would even win in his first ever race in that year's ARCA 200 at Daytona. It is believed that only two NASCAR Magnums survive, a restored Marty Robbins car and Richard's last Magnum. 
Following Kyle's surprise ARCA win, the third generation racer would run the Magnum part-time in Cub in four races that season, before wrecking the car in the qualifying race for the 1980 Daytona 500. The car would eventually be restored in Richard's 1978 spec and would be sold in 1995. That car now belongs to a private collection in California. The Magnum was always a massaged 4th gen charger from the start, as it is pretty much the same car underneath the sheet metal. As mentioned before, Chrysler was in increasingly dire straits at the time, so they didn't have the cash to develop a completely new model. Also not helping was smog regulations and automakers not figuring out how to get any sort of performance through them yet. That meant that even though that Dodge offered a high-performance GT model that used its 400 cubic inch B400 big block V8, that model still struggled to put out 190 horsepower. This is a base XE model that lent more towards the personal luxury coupe angle, which meant that instead of the fancy T-tops, you got a Landau top instead. This theme continues inside as fake wood trim is everywhere in a digital chromometer clock. The Charger's unibody B-body chassis sits underneath, as does its torsion bar front suspension and leaf sprung rear axle. There's no big block under the hood of this XE, instead being the base 318 cubic inch LA V8 that put out a paltry 135 horsepower when this car rolled off the Windsor Ontario assembly line in 1979. Add that to its 3,900 pound weight, and this car is. <laughs> not quick. There's a reason that this era of cars is looked down upon. These cars were choked from the factory, and as a result, luxury was their default selling point. But just look at it. It's just so agonizingly malaise. The motorized headlight covers. The hidden gas cap under the flip-up rear license plate. The Landau top. The 5 mile per hour crash bumpers. The chrome highlights everywhere. That fake wood paneling, again, everywhere. Like, I couldn't find the shifter button to get into gear. No, it's this fake wood circle on the top of the shifter that's actually the button. Dodge at the time called the unique three-bar grill retro at the time and would even compare the grill and nose to that of Accord. You know, the failed American luxury car brand that went under in 1937 that had nothing to do with Chrysler. Mm. Just a little too on the nose there, Dodge, considering the lack of on-track and sales success of the Magnum. This particular 1978 Dodge Magnum XE was purchased by the owner Zach in 2017 after spending several months looking for one. A lifelong Richard Petty fan, Zach wanted to find an old Mopar model that the king himself had driven on track back in the day. Chargers and Plymouths were far too expensive thanks to their boomer auction spikes in the odds, but the Magnum was a forgotten model with a curious history that any car person would rubberneck because of how rare and weird it is. Him and his father found this particular Magnum on the eastern side of Raleigh and made a quick deal with the owner as that man had long since given up making a petty clone car and the car had been sitting in the field for 10 years at that point. That previous owner couldn't figure out why the car refused to start, but it turns out that all the factory smog equipment and wiring was just confusing its very archaic computer. After doing a delete, it started right up and has run fine for the past five and a half years. They did end up replacing the ignition switch and coil after a while, as well as the radiator and all the hoses. Most of the AC system has been removed, but the original compressor is still on the car for the moment, so they don't have to figure out a new belt. This past fall, the Chrysler Torque Flight A727 3-speed automatic finally blew up, but they had recently just had it rebuilt and now shifts smoothly. The biggest issue at the moment is the lack of gauges, as his dad was driving in the last month when he saw a puff of smoke before losing them completely. This even led to the chromometer digital clock display disappearing. The other issue is the stick and brake pedal, which is probably due to the rear drums badly needing a service. It stops fine otherwise, but you have to tap the pedal off the floor just to keep them from dragging. The rest of the car is completely understored after 44 years of being on the road. The Landau top is cracked, and there's some rust here and there at the corners. This includes at the leading edge of the Landau top, where water tends to build up anyways, and where the rear window meets the trunk, which is now allowing water to build in the trunk. The headliner is grimy, and the vinyl interior panels are disintegrating after years of exposure in North Carolina's sun. The headlight shutters only lift about halfway, but 
Dodge did engineer a bypass where you can unplug the motor and turn this little knob at the bottom of said motor to manually raise them up and down. But this is a 44 year old unrestored car and it's lived a full life. It still starts up and runs relatively reliably as a fun third car for Zack and his dad. Even in its unrestored state, this car is still a showstopper at local car meets as it's probably one of the few remaining magnums on the road. They do intend to eventually restore this old car and try to take the old boat to Carlisle one day. On the road, this is probably the most boat-like car I've had on the show. No joke, the steering isn't as accurate as an old forklift, but the floaty suspension eats up the bumps without hesitation. I found myself often struggling to keep the wandering steering straight on sweeping curves, and it was hard to judge the more minute moves. Certainly not the sketchiest steering of a car I've driven on the show, and that would be the CJ2A from last year. But that's a stark contrast for modern cars with their electric power steering. The CJ <laughs> was essentially a tractor back in the day. Despite the stick and brake pedal, it actually stops relatively well thanks to its front discs and aforementioned rear drums. And despite the paltry malaise power output from the factory, the 318 smoothly gets up the speed at a pace that's not too slow or disappointing. But this 1979 Magnum is a far cry from where cars are today. It's a big, floaty, underpowered, carbureted, V8-powered, rear-wheel drive, personal luxury coupe. There's really not a car today that I would put in that category. The last personal luxury coupe that I can really think of was Chevrolet's W-Body Monte Carlo that went out of production in 2007. This was the category of car that companies like Dodge needed to pivot to as they couldn't sell big powered V8s anymore. They had to try to pivot towards luxury because that's all they could really do in the mid to late 70s, and sales suffered for it. Buyers were bored and, and were starting to discover that little cars made by Japanese and European companies were more fun to drive. Dodge was working on such a car that could compete, the Omni, and it was a stark contrast to a boat like this. Thanks to that car launching the year before the 1979 oil crisis and taking full advantage of its small size and efficiency, and Iacocca's expansive plan for the K platform, Chrysler was able to convince the government to get that federal loan to avoid bankruptcy. The 1979 Dodge Magnum XC, however, was the last gasp of Dodge's personal luxury coupes. Despite its more aggressive appearance, it lacked any sort of performance that it was trying to evoke from happier times. While more aerodynamic than the car it started off as, it was still not aerodynamic enough to yield the results to keep two of NASCAR's top drivers at the time in their stable. And it was a sales flop, especially in the second year with the second oil crisis of the decade, this time spurred by the Iranian Revolution and the resultant drop in oil production. While 47,827 Magnums left Windsor in its first year, just 25,367 were produced in 79 and as a result, the model was dropped. With it, Chrysler's long-running full-size B-body platform would also be retired for the newly downsized R-body platform. Dodge's new full-size offering, the St. Regis, would only be available as a sedan. The Magnum would be retired by another forgotten model, the much smaller Mirada, and that car too would have a story similar to that of the Magnum. The nameplate would live on in Mexico and Brazil on completely unrelated coupes and would eventually return to the state in 2005 with the wagon that everyone remembers. The original Dodge Magnum is a lot of things, but it was the wrong car for changing times, and as a result, it's now forgotten with time. 1979 Dodge Magnum XE, a perfect snapshot of the malaise era. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you once again for watching another episode of Wookie Drives. This week's episode comes courtesy of Zach of Troutman, North Carolina. Huge shout out to Zach for letting me film his old malaise dodge for the show. You can go ahead and follow Zach on socials at Booth34Diecast, and he runs a, the Booth34Diecast booth at Main Street Antiques in Mooresville, North Carolina. So yeah, if you're in Mooresville, check out his booth at Main Street Antiques. If you have a car or truck you'd like to see on the show and happen to be in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, Submit your car by emailing me at wikidrives at gmail.com. That's right. Submit your car to wikidrives at gmail.com. That is wikidrives at gmail.com. 
Don't forget to give the video a like, share with all your Blaze Car friends, drop a comment with some feedback. Any feedback is good feedback as any sort of interaction really helps this small channel grow. And finally, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell for more Wookiee drives like these. Thank you so much for watching and have a good day. You are looking at a magic means of transportation. New Dodge Magnum XE. A splendid combination of touring car and luxury car. Consider Magnum XE's exciting update of the classic cord type grill. Inside, a place of sophisticated instrumentation, electronic wizardry, snug, crafted, comfortable. See the new Dodge Magnum XE, a magic means of transportation.